One of the most famous American Indians in early American history was Tecumseh. Until the Americans killed him in 1853, he and his brother, Tenkswatawa, were the co-creators of the biggest pan-Indian confederation in early American history. I mentioned in previous episodes that during the presidency of George Washington and the administrations right after, the most important foreign relations that America had weren't with Britain, they weren't with France, they were with Indian tribes because these were their neighbors and they could help America in its beginning and also threaten to destroy it in a way that foreign powers couldn't. In other accounts of Tecumseh's life, Tenkswatawa, his brother, he was dismissed as a charlatan and a drunk, which he was, but there's a lot more to his story. He plays a very interesting role in early American history, the role of a prophet, the role of a spiritual leader, the role of somebody who claims to have a vision from God and he can lead people into the next age. He's sort of like a Joseph Smith, but from the Native American side. Today's guest, Peter Cousins, argues that while Tecumseh was a brilliant leader and a diplomat and a war leader who was admired by the same white Americans he opposed, it was Tenkswatawa, who was called the Shawnee Prophet, who created a doctrine of religious and cultural revitalization that managed to unify and revitalize the tribes of the Old Northwest. He had a vision that American Indian culture would be revitalized, they would be able to push back against white settlers and prevent their culture from being destroyed. So Cousins is the author of the new book, Tecumseh and the Prophet. And in this episode, we discuss the chaos and violence of the young American Republic when settlers were spilling across the Appalachians, which led to violent conflict with tribes there when they were trying to exploit lands won from the British in the War of Independence, disregarding the land claims of the Indian owners. The Shawnee brothers who retaliated against this threat, Cousins argues, were arguably the most significant siblings in Native American history, and they deserve a really large place in American history itself. So there's a lot here about the formation of early America, relations between American Indians and the United States, and also the spiritual role that Tetsuakawa plays and how he was able to form this enormous coalition that threatened the survival of early America. Really fascinating glimpse into this period in American history, and I hope you enjoy this discussion with Peter Cousins. And one other thing I'll mention before we start, the early part of our interview is cut off in the video. The question that I'm asking him that pops up in the beginning of the interview is that I ask him, what are some of the biggest misconceptions in early American history, especially regarding Native Americans? So he's answering that question. So if it seems like we're jumping in right in the middle of a discussion, that's why it is the way it is. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Peter Cousins. Peter, welcome to the show. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting into this, and um, we're going to do a deep dive into Native American society and customs, and the culture that exists at the beginning of the 19th century is different from the 1830s and 1840s and the Indian Removal Act and everything, and it's a very complicated history, but I suppose one way to uh, jump into all this is um, from what you've seen of how Native American history is usually presented are there any misunderstandings that you see appear consistently that you'd like to clear up or you hope that your book can clear up? Another thing that struck me, and, and not so much as I was writing The Earth is Weeping, which, of course, dealt with the Indian Wars in the American West, but occurred to me as I undertook Tecumseh and the Prophet, and that is just how different... Um, Indian societies were west of the Mississippi as opposed to east of the Mississippi. Uh, without uh, generalizing too much from tribe to tribe, there was a tendency, a greater tendency for Native Americans from different tribes to see, to recognize their common interests and unite against uh, a common threat, threat such as uh, white uh, expansion presented than there was west of the Mississippi. It, it just very, very um, uh, more greater, very greater sense of cohesion and a sense of Indianness, so to speak, among Native Americans east of the Mississippi 
and and particularly north of the Ohio uh, River, you know, the region that is today's Midwest and the area in which Tecumseh and the Prophet plays itself out. Um, yeah, and before uh, getting into the nature of uh, power and what the relations were like between the American government uh, and the Confederacy that Tecumseh left, maybe it's a, it would benefit to go into some of the aspects of how uh, Confederate politics among Native Americans worked. Because when we hear the word Confederacy, we don't really pause and think what that means from a governmental point of view. We might think of the Confederacy in the Civil War, but that's not what we're getting at. We're talking about uh, states that developed within a republic after the age of the Enlightenment. Uh, confederacy is a word that's used all across time. You could talk about tribal confederacies in Central Asia during the time of Herodotus in the fourth century BC and a collection of tribes that unite together for a larger common purpose. Uh, so could you really lay out what did that look like to be a confederacy leader that Tecumseh was? Um, and especially amongst the tribes that he lived, what did that look like? Because you mentioned the east and west of the Mississippi, it's very different. Right. And I think I think uh, if I could uh, preface this and try to frame our our, our discussion um, a little a little more specifically in putting this in, in time and place and then I'll, then I'll address your question uh, directly. At the time of the creation of, of the United States and post American Revolution, of course, the Indian tribes along the, the East Coast had ceased to exist or, or fra fragments of them remained either along the East Coast or, or, uh, uh, or farther West, pushed farther West. But you essentially had three geographic areas, um, the Indian tribes West and Mississippi, and of course there were great, great, great differences and variations among them. You had um, you, what, later called the four civilized tribes south of the Ohio River. Uh, They're called that because they tended to embrace um, American ways uh, with greater ease and uh, uh, greater, greater desire, actually, than other tribes. The tribes east of Mississippi, south of the Ohio River, in what today constitutes the Deep South, the Creeks, Choctaw, Cherokee, and Chickasaw would be your second geographical region. And then the tribes, so-called Eastern Woodland Indians who uh, occupied what is today the, the West, the Ohio Valley, the Upper Great Lakes region, and spilling over into Canada from, again, from the Mississippi East to uh, the the, the western border of Pennsylvania. And that's the region in which uh, Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa played out their destinies by and large. Among the tribes, these tribes in particular, the there was a history of confederations or confederacies before Tenskwatawa and Tecumseh came forward with, with their confederacy. Um, and they, they all bore certain similarities, although that of Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa was by far the most expansive geographically and in terms of number of tribes it encompassed. But an Indian Confederacy in the time of which we're speaking and in the context of Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa, it really was a, uh, and, and you, you said it well, uh, to paraphrase you, that it was a, a, a kind of a, a coming together of tribes or portions of tribes with a common interest, uh, in this case, preventing uh, white expansion onto Indian lands, uh, and also with a shared spiritual, religious, and religious beliefs. Uh, in terms of, of following Tenskwatawa's prophetic prophetic religious doctrine. But even though they can't, would come together under the leadership of one, one chief, in this case, say Tecumseh, for 
uh, for military and political purposes, the constituent tribes or portions of tribes never, um, never surrendered any of their prerogatives to the leadership of the Confederacy. Again, in this case, to come and they were all, they were always free to pull out uh, whenever they saw fit, and so it was really the Confederacies were really more, you know, a a, a, a loose grouping of tribes or portions of tribes with perceived shared interests, but who retained again all their prerogatives, all their rights, and over whom, just as within his own tribe. A, a, a chief, a, a, a recognized leader exercised authority so long as the members of the Confederacy had confidence in him. He, again, had no institutional powers on which he could, he could fall back or, re, or rely. So it was really, it was, it was again, a grouping of sh with shared interests, but uh, very much voluntary and very much retaining uh, their own independence within the Confederacy. Very tenuous. Right. Um, and now coming to the, this particular period in history in the early 18th or the early 19th century, this is different uh, than other time periods because when we think of the story of American Indian relations, when we think, I don't, the first Thanksgiving, Native Americans have power then because there are only a few boats on the soil of North America. But then our mind just skips over into the Indian Removal Act. And we know that there was fighting amongst the pre-revolutionary period and the revolutionary period, but we don't think much of it. Uh, I was interested when I found out that in the administration of George Washington, one of the most important foreign policy relations he held were with tribal leaders. Many of them were guests of the White House. Uh, this continues with other administrations shortly after. And so this is an interesting period in the early 19th century when relations are evolving. The power of the United States government is growing, but by no means do they have complete and total power. And the worry, the threat to the government, if or the, the import, let's not say threat, the importance of relate, friendly relations seem to be far more important with Native Americans than they would with France or England because this is these are neighbors that they have to contend with. Um, that's what I was interested to learn, but of course you know more, way more about that. So what are the state of affairs at this time period with Tecumseh and Tenkswetawa, uh, in uh, and the American government? No, you're absolutely right. Um, if we look at the period um, when Tenkswetawa uh, and Tecumseh's movement first first blossomed, 1806, the um, United States was militarily very weak. The, uh, the, the founding fathers had a tremendous aversion to a standing army. And uh, what, um, going back a few years to 1791, to the defeat of um, St. Clair's army on the, Wa on the Wabash River, uh, a, a struggle in which uh, Tecumseh participated as a, as a young man, the almost the entire American standing army, such as it was, you know, it's just 1,400 men, nearly the entire standing army was wiped out in a single battle with the Indians. And the government did very well to rectify that um, situation in the, in the years to follow again, because of a, a distrust of a, a large standing army, there, there was a, a, a reliance on state militias to keep the peace within their own borders and to act as the first line of defense against Indian incursions. But there wasn't really um, a, a force that was strong enough to assert itself in plans still held by the Indians with any certainty of success. You know, in, in 1806, when, when the alliance, when the, the, the Confederacy uh, that Tecumseh and Tex would eventually um, 
turn into the largest Pan-Indian confederation in American history when it was when it was born. The there were the Indians controlled all of the modern Midwest, with the exception of Ohio, which was already heavily populated. But the remainder of the Midwest was uh, largely um, empty of, 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 white, of white settlers. Uh, and in the Deep South, the tribes of the Deep South controlled the entire region uh, west of central Georgia uh, to um, nearly the Mississippi River. And uh, with the exception of, of what is today um, Eastern Tennessee. So it, the government really had little choice but to negotiate with the tribes and treat them with far um, greater respect than they otherwise would have. Because at the same time, you had you know, strong Indian neighbors occupying today's Midwest, occupying today's Deep South, you had, again, the, the lack of a strong standing army, and there was still a, a threat, kind of a, a, a um, sub rosa threat from Great Britain and the possibility that, that war might uh, erupt again with Great Britain at any time. So the United States had to, had to play things very carefully with the hmm. Indians at that time. Well, this uh, gets us into uh, the main point of your book, um, with uh, Tecumseh. And so can you introduce uh, Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa to me? Uh, who were they? Why did they architect such a large confederation? Because you mentioned earlier that this happens under extraordinary circumstances. This happens due to the natural leadership abilities and charisma of the particular leader. What were the conditions that caused them to do this? And how were they able to do this? It's be hard to condense, condense this into a, yeah. few, <laughs> a few minutes, obviously. But circumstances um, in, in 1805, 1806, in the Midwest, even though with the exception of, of Ohio, there was not a particularly large white presence in terms of, of population, uh, the white influence was great and it was, it was generally pernicious. Um, the, the tribes north of the Ohio River, including the Shawnee, among uh, of which Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa were members, uh, were ravaged by alcoholism. Uh, you know, frontier rot gut whiskey was was decimating the, the tribes. Uh, white man's diseases were also wreaking havoc with the tribes, and there was, even though they had not lost. A significant amount of lands in, again, with the exception of Ohio, there was a sense of cultural and social dissolution among the Indians. And game was also becoming scarce. Uh, there was a sense that, that, that among the tribes that they had somehow somehow strayed and, and that, uh, that the apocalypse might even be on the horizon. And Teng Swatawa, who was able to, to play into that sense of, of, of again, cultural dissolution, uh, societal uh, disintegration that was uh, it has, having such a great impact on the tribes in the Midwest. Teng Swatawa, I'll introduce first because he was the actual, he was the originator of the Confederation. Teng Swatawa was born in 17. Um, 75, he was, uh, by all accounts, he was a misfit. I mean, he, <laughs> he was uh, an inept hunter. Uh, he, as a boy, he shot his, one of his eyes out while using a bow and arrow. He fell early victim to alcoholism. He was um, a wastrel. He was a, a, a misfit not at all well regarded among his fellow Shawnee. He's complete, complete dissolute. He was a fa failure as a medicine man. And then, and then one, one evening he uh, 
fell into a trance, a coma, whatever you want to call it, and emerged with this remarkably remarkable prophetic vision of uh, a future rich for the Indians if they would um, accept the message that he purported to receive from the great spirit, the master of life, while he was in this in this uh, state of trance. Um, so here we have Tenskwatawa originating the Confederation as a spiritual movement and gaining adherence uh, with his spiritual message of, of again, of societal rebirth, cultural revitalization. And then you have Tecumseh, the, the elder brother, who was from, from childhood, he was recognized as a very promising young warrior. He was, he was uh, as handsome and well-proportioned and, and charismatic as his brother Tanks Latawa was was uh, was dissolute and uh, uh, and misfit. Both of them were sons of a prominent war leader named Pukeshinwa, who had been killed fighting the Virginia militia in 1774. So, and they belonged to a clan and a division of the Shawnee, known for producing war leaders. So, so Tecumseh was born with, with a lot of things in his favor. Um, and uh, young men naturally gravitated to him. Interestingly, by the time they, they, they emerged um, as strong leaders in their own right, and as they were creating this confederacy, they were doing so largely from uh, Native Americans outside of their own tribe, outside of the Shawnee tribe. The Shawnees had divided in the wake of um, military, the military defeats that, they, that the Indians suffered in the, uh, in the region in the 1790s. Most Shawnees had either migrated to modern day Missouri or had begun a process of accommodation with the people of Ohio. And they, they largely rejected the message of Tenskwatawa and later of Tecumseh. And in this sense, they were unique in that they, they, maybe I'm getting off on a tangent earlier, but they drew most of their support from other tribes rather than from their own people. And this is a common misunderstanding. It, uh, and I've seen, I, I constantly see Tecumseh referred to as the great Shawnee leader, the great Shawnee chief. <laughs> well, he was Shawnee, but his appeal, as well as that Tenskwatawa, was with uh, other tribes of the region, uh, by and large. So, again, to introduce the two of them, you have Tecumseh, who was a natural leader of men. He was all, already a proven war leader, um, albeit in, a, in a, a small way. He had a, a relatively small following of Shawnees in 1806, perhaps um, you know, 10% of the tribe that still resided in the Midwest looked to him for leadership. And Tanks Watawa, before his prophetic vision, was struggling to, to find a place for himself uh, Outside of the outside of the liquor bottle, uh, <laughs> again failing as a medicine man and essentially sponging off Tecumseh. Well, yeah, I mean this is uh, really interesting here because um, with these two brothers, they sound like a, a trope in classical literature where you have the level-headed brother who is the responsible leader, and then you have the other brother who's wild, gets people in trouble, like uh, I don't know Paris and Hector in the Iliad, or uh, yeah, you could probably think of a million other ones too. Uh, and I also like for Tenkswatawa, he has this vision of uh, renewal. He sounds like a revivalist preacher from the 19th century or the Great Awakening, uh, a, a figure that you would see in other places in time in history. He just so happens to be Native American. Uh, 
do you do you know from accounts what his vision was? Was it that uh, the white men or Americans would be chased out, or there would be a, a Indian tribes would be stronger, or there would be a shared coexistence but led by an ethos of Native Americanism? Or do you have any idea one way or another? Fortunately, I do. In fact. If you were to ask me what my favorite part of the book is, what part of the book I enjoy the my book I enjoy the most, it is my recounting of Tengswatawa's initial vision, where that took him, as well as subsequent visions that he had, that all coalesced into a a, a moral and uh, religious creed. Um, fortunately, there are excellent records extant in which. He related himself his vision, and um, that these his relating of the visions were recorded by by other Indians and preserved. They were recorded by um, Shaker Shakers who visited his village. As a number of just wonderful sources, so I was able to really, I think, bring it bring it to life. And the, his, the nature of his vision, it. It, is, it still strikes me as so remarkable. Again, you know, here we have this, this guy, he's in his 30s, he's accomplished zero in his, in his life except <laughs> to have uh, two wives, one of whom constantly henpecked him, again, sponging off his brother. And one night he's, he's huddled over his fire, he's contemplating, you know, the, the, what, what's been going wrong for the Indians uh, of, of his tribe, as well as as the region, uh, larger region, and he 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 passes out. Uh, he goes into a trance, so deep a trance that others, including Tecumseh and uh, and his closest friends, thought he was dead, and actually began preparations for his burial. And after two days in this deep, deep trance. He, he suddenly emerges. Um, not only is he no longer an absolute you know, reprobate and uh, seemingly incurable alcoholic. Um, in fact, he never drank another drop the rest of his life. Uh, there's something that maybe uh, Alcoholics Anonymous could study <laughs> text <Tex Matava, laughs> with, with profit, but he presented this remarkable vision of having ascended uh, to the afterlife, to heaven, to have seen the suffering endured by those, both white and Indian, who had uh, take, you know, taken the wrong road, so to speak, alcoholics, those who were covetous uh, of others' property, those who abused their wives, People who just who just had strayed from the path of, of of moral and spiritual purity, and what he presented was a, a detailed uh, detailed path for restoring the the Native Americans to the more halcyon days of the path past, and that we re, that required that they do a number of things. One of which was to cease having anything to do with Americans, not with whites in general, uh, but with Americans in particular. I mean, he, you know, he accepted that, uh, I think there was, there was a certain pragmatism in his vision. He accepted that the English uh, and the French were, were different. They were uh, actually higher creations in the sphere of uh, human life than were the Americans who he said were the spawn of, of, a, of a great crab that had come ashore on the Atlantic Ocean and spewed forth this scum across the lands. The English and the, and the French were different, but he asked that his the Indians eschew the American, American ways, eschew alcohol, um, American foods, American made goods, and rely more on their own resources. What he envisioned was a coexistence uh, with, in which really the Indians would go about go their way, live their traditional way of life of uh, 
uh, that was partly agricultural, partly based on hunting, and the Americans could do what they pleased. Um, Tecumseh, we can talk about this as we get to that, but Tecumseh would, would build on that uh, into a, a political and military alliance as the danger of white, further white encroachment on Indian lands in the Midwest grew. But initially it was a, was a movement meant to, to restore the Native Americans to uh, their previously held virtues, to basically to sober them up as he himself had sobered up from his prophetic visions and to, uh, and to lead them back to a more, more of a golden age. Um, and in his initial manifestations, there was, there was really no talk of, of fighting with Americans. Okay. Um, so I'm really, in your take on him, he's a, he's a revivalist and that can mean good things or bad things, depending on your perspective. And then also how well people did in the past. Uh, a Martin Luther is someone that's looked upon more fo fondly as a revivalist. Uh, Joseph Smith, different people have different accounts. If you're Mormon, of course, much more positive. If you don't like what he did, then more negative. Moving down the scale, L. Ron Hubbard. Um, hope I'm not going to get Scientology hate mail here or hacked, but um, we'll see. Uh, so, but what's your take on him? Um, okay, his his confederacy didn't work, but I don't think that's a good way to judge his efficacy. Um, so, what what's your take on him as a revivalist? I think he was the most significant and successful prophet. Uh, to use the word prophet as as. Uh, uh, the, as the Native Americans did, that is to say, a seer, one who could see into the future, one who could communicate with the, the master of life, the master of breath, the great spirit, whatever terms a particular tribe used to refer to God. Um, Native Americans believe that there were people possessed of these abilities, and Tanks Watawa was by no means the first a great prophet, even among the tribes of the present day Midwest. He drew very heavily on the teachings of a, a Delaware Indian prophet named Neolin, uh, who worked with Pontiac back in the 1760s in fighting the British in Pontiac's war. There were, there were certain parallels between Pontiac and Neolin and Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa that I get into in the book. And then both of them recognize their debt to kneel in, but I think his, his efficacy was, was tremendous. He was able to draw adherence to his religious and social creed from uh, a dozen tribes, from as, as far away as um, Southern Canada to all the way to the banks of the Alabama River among the Creek Indians in the South. So he, it was very efficacious. It, it drew tribes together into a confederation. Again, that Tecumseh turned into more of a, a military political force. The only other Indian prophet that comes close to, in my way of thinking is Wovoka uh, in the 1880s in Oregon, a Paiute in Oregon, who drew upon his understanding of Christianity and native tradition to, to create a movement that culminated in the, in the ghost dance. But that never really gained any traction because uh, with the exception of uh, among the Lakota Sioux and with tragic, tragic results, you know, the tragedy of wounded knee being the, the apex of that, but it never, it never led to the creation of an intertribal alliance in the way that the, 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 uh, the creed of Tenskwatawa did. So I, I found him to be a very impressive figure. In fact, uh, um, when I began this project, I proposed it to my editor, to, to Knopf, as a biography of Tecumseh. Period, and I, you know, I envisioned 
Shanks Watawa playing a distinctly supporting role, a limited supporting role, and one that uh, ended with the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811, which is what historians have always tended to do. Once I began my research, I, I, I said, whoa, wait a minute here. Uh, Tang Swatawa not only created the circumstances that allowed Tecumseh to come forward in his own right, but he maintained influence right up to and beyond the time of Tecumseh's death at the Battle of the Thames, 1813. And they maintained a relationship that was really symbiotic in nature uh, throughout the the course of their conspiracy. The, the became the more dominant political and clearly the military leader, but and but Teng Swatawa was he was a spiritual leader and also he was uh, even though he was given to braggadocia and tended to to uh, put his foot in his mouth at times he was also a fairly crafty diplomat in his own right. So the two of them, I, I quickly realized, had to be. Uh, examined together, they could not. They could not be separated. It would be doing uh, a great historical injustice to the period if I were to attempt that. And I think the reason why, part of the reason why biographers have done that in the past, um, is because starting from you know, contemporaneous accounts of the two, because Tecumseh was much more relatable uh, to to whites. I mean, he was one who. Yeah, he, he was trying to forge a, a military and political response to American, the threat of American expansion in a way that whites could understand, whereas Teng Swatawa um, presented this, this social and religious vision and creed that was far beyond anything that whites could comprehend by and large. And... Um, so there was a tendency to, to dismiss him and see him not as a serious figure at all. And also Teng Swatawa, he took, uh, has taken a severe hit among historians because he advocated uh, the elimination of witches among the Indians. And he saw witchcraft as one of the leading causes of, of um, the degeneracy among the Indians. And that was seen by white observers then and up and you know to, to the present as uh, evidence that he was you know in some way savage. But that really shows a, a tremendous lack of understanding not only of Shawnee culture, but also of Indian cult, the culture of Indian tribes east of the Mississippi River writ large. Uh, there was a strong belief among the Indians in witchcraft and witches and in their power to, to do evil among, among the Native Americans. In fact, um, the Shawnee themselves maintained a belief in witchcraft into the early 20th century, uh, at least some Shawnee. So that was a powerful element in Indian religious belief. But Teng Swatawa's pursuit of purported witches uh, you know, held him in, in, in bad stead with, with whites who were hmm. trying to understand them. Well, I'm curious about how this confederacy comes together, because that's why Tecumseh is still well known today. For Teng Swatawa to be the religious symbol of this confederacy, how would other Native Americans hear about this and be so compelled by this message that they would join this confederacy even if they live far away? I mean, there's no pan Native American newspaper at this time in circulation. Uh, communication networks are pretty scattered. How do people hear about this? What compels us to join? And how does this confederacy get put together? Well, you know, it's interesting when you say that about, about the communications network. I sort of assume that myself, but truth be told, it normally would take more time from for instructions from Washington, D.C. to reach the territorial governor of Indiana, uh, William Henry Harrison, or even the state governor of Ohio, than it would for 
Indian runners to take messages from the banks of the Wabash River in uh, present day Indiana, or uh, when the, looking back a little further when the movement first started from uh, North Central Ohio to modern day Wisconsin and Eastern Minnesota, it would take, or, or modern day Illinois, it would take less time for Indian run runners to traverse those distances than it would for messages to get from, again from Washington DC out to the the uh, to the to the modern Midwest. So so huh. word did travel quickly, and uh, Tanks Matawa sent runners out um, to to promulgate his creed. It drew, it drew significant interest. Uh, there were pilgrims coming from as far away as again. Uh, uh, northern Wisconsin, eastern Minnesota, uh, throughout the greater Midwest, in the upper Great Lakes, came to his and Tecumseh's village to hear his message. Um, so it, it wasn't that difficult for the, the Indians to communicate among themselves relatively rapidly. That certainly was something that surprised, surprised me as in, in researching, uh, researching the book. Um, but the Tengswatawa's movement, it, it sort of, it ebbed and flowed. I mean, his the village in which he and Tecumseh resided, their, their Shawnee village to which the pilgrims were attracted from various tribes, it couldn't sustain a large population year round. So in the years from 1806 to 1809, you'd have an ebbing and flowing of, of, of uh, of the faithful who would come come to uh, to hear his message and later to hear Tecumseh's message of, of uh, Indian unity against against the threat of, of white encroachment and then return to their home villages and there was, there was kind of a pattern of coming and going until um, until 1809 and if you ask me why 1809 is significant we can we can proceed from there with, with kind of the rise of of Tecumseh. Yeah, well, I mean, that's another interesting point right there, that communications networks are more sophisticated for Native Americans than they are on the American side, since there's barely a functioning U.S. postal system at this time. Having runners, knowing how to navigate the terrain, that's a big advantage, and it's probably not going to be supplanted for decades to come. Well, let's get into that next step you were talking about, the formation of this confederacy. What causes this confederacy to form and what are what leads us to 1813 and uh, Tecumseh's end? Right, what, what, what led, um, I mean, Tecumseh began to assert himself within a year of the formation of, of, of the Confederacy. He began to, to warn, um, warn uh, state leaders in Ohio warn the territorial governor of Indiana, William Henry Harrison, that enough was enough, that um, he, Tanksbatawa, and their followers would accept the boundaries that had been created uh, up, and, up until that time, even though um, William Henry Harrison had engineered the, the purchase of great swaths of, of Indian land in Northern Ohio, parts of Indiana, a good part of Illinois, even though it wasn't yet settled uh, very much, uh, through chicanery and, and, and other shenanigans, allowing for all that and for the fact that the Indians had lost a great deal of their land by 1806, 1807, Tecumseh and Tanks Patel were willing to accept that. But they said, you know, no more, no more, that you've, you've gone far enough and that any further inroads on Indian lands in the Midwest would be grounds for a defensive war. Uh, in 18, 1809, William Henry Harrison, for his own political reasons, uh, his own, to kind of sharp his own tenuous political fortunes, decided to uh, to, to test that. And he negotiated a treaty at Fort Wayne in 1809 with pliant elements of several 
uh, tribes uh, in the region, pliant elements of tribes who didn't, in some cases, even have, <clears throat> excuse me, legitimate claims to the land that he was negotiating for, and just signing away more land. And with that, uh, you know, Tecumseh said enough is enough. He began gaining uh, more adherence, uh, particularly not from tribes uh, in Wisconsin and, uh, and Michigan, who had not yet felt the, the threat of white encroachment directly, but could kind of see the handwriting on the wall for, from what had happened in Ohio and Southern Indiana. And so they, they became you know, willing adherents uh, of Tecumseh um, and Tangswatawa, but really many of them more uh, for the political and military reasons of preserving their lands than uh, a strict acceptance of all aspects of Tangswatawa's doctrine. But even with that provocation in 1809, Tecumseh and Tangswatawa were loath to make war because they realized that uh, they could not hope to prevail without British assistance. You know, the British controlled Canada. Uh, the British had been fickle allies in the past, but they still were the most reliable source of weapons, ammunition, and the kind, of, and the, you know the, the the tools of war that the Indians needed to have a uh, a fighting chance against the Americans. So, between 1809 and 1811, you had what I would call sort of a um, sort of a phony war, to use a World War II analogy, in which um, both sides saw a conflict as, as perhaps inevitable, but neither were, were, were willing to provoke it. That changed in 1811 when Tecumseh, after a particularly contentious conference with uh, William Henry Harrison, decided to go to south of the Ohio River try to bring the Southern tribes, which were very, very powerful Indian, Indian nations, again, the Chickasaw, the Creek, the Choctaw, the Cherokee, they, they could muster several thousand warriors each to try to bring them into his alliance to create a, uh, an, an even broader uh, pan-Indian resistance against American encroachment. Not for, not for offensive reasons, but to defend what they had. While he was away in the South, uh, William Henry Harrison saw an opportunity to eliminate the threat that the Shawnee brothers posed. And he crossed over onto what was still by treaty Indian land to attack Tengswatawa's village uh, of Tippecanoe. And thus provoked the, the outbreak of, uh, of hostilities with the Indians. So it was William Henry Harrison, it was the Americans who provoked conflict with Tecumseh and Tengswatawa. Uh, they were acting really in, in a defensive manner. Well, famously, I mean, Tecumseh is killed and we know historians there, but as you mentioned, Tengswatawa is not killed what happens to him afterwards? I'm really curious because uh, I imagine many people came to his banner because they think he's speaking prophetically. All of this is leading up to a great confrontation. Presumably we're going to win this confrontation. We're going to reorder what's happening so that our lands aren't gonna be encroached upon and we're gonna have a better history for ourselves. When that battle is lost, it seems like all this buildup and this prophecy fails. Uh, and there's a lot of cases we could look at in history where there's a prophet, he issues a prophecy, whether it's Christ's return, whether it's something else, it fails. And then either he loses all standing and all clout, or he reformulates what he says and says, well, actually it was metaphorical. It was this or that. So thanks Watawa, what happens to him? Um, what is his next step in life? And how do, how do his followers in war react to it after their defeat? That, that's a, uh, 
I, I don't want to, you know, spoil the <laughs> spoil the ending of the story. Um, but it's it's both a tragic and really com- compelling story. The the uh, last years of Tanks Watawa, you know, Tecumseh is killed at the Battle of the Thames in 1813 in in modern Western Ontario, fighting with the British. The um, alliance essentially crumbles. Uh, at, one, at, at this apex, he had over there were over six thousand warriors that that flocked uh, to the cause of Tecumseh and Tanks you know, in early 1813. I mean, just in context, that's more than three times as many warriors as Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse were able to muster at the Little Bighorn, which of course is the greatest uh, convergence of, of Indian warriors west of the Mississippi. Um, in, in, in American history. It crumbles from some 6,500 to fewer than 350 warriors uh, and their families in the aftermath of the Battle of Thames. Tanks Watawa um, and his remaining followers, they kind of, kind of melt into the woods in, in Canada, living off British largesse. Tanks Watawa, who really has no skill as a military leader. He um, leads some of his followers faultingly uh, in support of the British um, in a couple of engagements um, the following year in the War of 1812, then largely removes himself from the fighting and the picture. But he does, you know, and this is one of the things I really, in some ways I find him a more I don't know if the word appealing is right, but a cer- certainly a much more relatable and human figure than Tecumseh in that, you know, again, he was this, he was a, an alcoholic, ne'er-do-well before uh, his vision, but even in the aftermath of defeat, when most of his followers did abandon him uh, because, you know, his creed, did not uh, did not provide victory. He himself remained sober. He looked very um, very much to the interests of his remaining followers uh, as best he could, and uh, he remained a um, remained a, a, a remarkably honorable figure up until his death in the uh, in the 1830s and uh which again is another very very compelling part of the book i don't want to spoil it now right. but, <laughs> but uh i was actually just to tea to give readers a little little bit of a uh tease readers a little bit here i was actually able to to find precisely where he died in in modern day kansas and um discover what transpired in the la- very last days of his life. And it's a very, very compelling and, and tragic end. Well, um, something else that you say is that um, the two of them belong in the uh, annals or annals of American history, the brothers Tecumseh and Tanks Uh So what do you think should be said about them uh, for their place in history? I, I think that uh, they, again, they part, were certainly not the architects of the only pan-Indian alliance to exist in American history. Uh, I don't know, I mean, United States history, you know, post-revolutionary, well, post, you know, say post uh, um, 17th century, uh, but they they created the the broadest Indian alliance uh, that ever existed. They they came close to achieving their 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 ends. Uh, had the British been more forthcoming in their support and more forthcoming in, in the, the uh, in the resources they provided to that part of Canada, it's not inconceivable that the Indian Confederation would have prevailed and that uh, modern day Michigan uh, 
may very well have become an Indian buffer state between Canada and the United States. So they, they created the, the broadest Indian alliance. Certainly Tengswatawa in his own right was the most influential uh, Indian prophet in Native American history. Although I think there, there can be no dispute disputing the fact that they were the most significant siblings in, in Native American history. When you consider that their alliance uh, incorporated nearly, nearly one third of the United States as it then existed, nearly you know, one third of the country east of the Mississippi River at the time, uh, that's, no, that's no small amount of, of, of land. I think you also really have to, if you're giving Native Americans their due, consider them to be two of the, the most significant brothers in American history, again, in the annals of America writ large. Uh, it's, they're certainly, they're certainly very, I mean, the only, I really can't think of any parallels except maybe the Kennedy brothers mm. uh, in, in, in political, uh, military, uh, social terms uh, in American history. All right. Well, that's a very high praise and a very high standard. So we could only get to the tip of the iceberg. And as you alluded to, there's a lot more to the story of Tengswatawa and what happens after 1813 up to the end of his life. Uh, so this is a really interesting uh, chapter in history. And for those who want to check it out, the book is Tecumseh and the Prophet. Peter, thank you for joining us. Can I add kind of one last point? Scott? Oh, yeah, sure. One it's, last, yeah. The story is not going to end here. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm working on another book that oh, uh, will essentially complete the trilogy. You know, I've, I've spoken of the Indian Wars of the American West as being, being uh, you know, one epic in in the uh, in the conquest of the of the um, North American continent by the United States, and I'm in Tecumseh and the Prophet. We look at uh, what transpired in the, in the modern day Midwest, Upper Great Lakes. I'm working on a book now that treats of the Deep South and will essentially complete the picture. And then the working title of that book is uh, Red, uh, Old Red Sticks and Old Hickory, The Creeks, Andrew Jackson and America's Most Brutal Indian War, in which I look at the Creek War and its antecedents. The Creek War occurred more or less simultaneously with the events of uh, 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 the War of 1812 and, and Tecumseh's, uh, Tecumseh's death. And he, in fact, played a great part in, in uh, inspiring a, a militant faction among the, the Creeks that brought this conflict about. Um, so with that book, I will essentially have completed a, a, a trilogy that I hope tells the, the, in the fullest way possible the story of the dispossession of uh, Indian lands throughout the modern day United States. Okay, yeah, that's great. I mean, that's another important chapter there that will really round out the picture here. So thanks for sharing all this, Peter. Really appreciate uh, having you on. My pleasure.